And uh, our next guest who is actually not present, but is Ivan Zuel Isen, Chief Nanda Indu, who is the President of the Ohanese UK. For those who don't know, Ohanese is the umbrella of the UK, which is an honor of the Ohanese He is on his way. So, um, so the Reverend has a message for us and uh, the next to hear Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. It's such an honor to be here. You know, you can tell I'm not Nigerian, but I'm really delighted to be here. But I have not forgot that, you know, our mayor's footsteps might be a bit I've been asked to share briefly about some of the challenges that we face, but I think Auntie has picked up a lot of that in their presentation. So I'm local. I happen to do a few things here in Greater Manchester nationally. So I'll quickly run through some of these slides. So I'll give it a bit of background, some evidence we know, current threats, some of the challenges and opportunities you and I have to effect change. And then also one of the organizations that we set up recently, Auntie talked about sickle cells, she talked about dementia. So we've set up the Caribbean and African Health Network. And it's in that, you know, tackling some of those issues we have within the Black Caribbean and African community. And then a bit of confusion. So I have a quote here from Nelson Mandela, and he says, as we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So we hear. If we can put fear aside, then you know it brings about some change. So I've been about myself. I don't have a colourful journey like you know our mayor does, but I'm interested in you know going out there, being with those who are the least, the lucky, the poor, the vulnerable, and those without voice. I do lots of engagement. You know, Auntie was telling us about going along to meetings and not necessarily for it to be paid. I get to do all that. And I tend to work a lot with people of different faiths as well. And real passion for HIV, female genital mutilation, modern slavery, domestic violence, health inequalities, and some freelance consulting. And as a result of all these things, I get to serve on a few boards. Right, so DME, we know it's a label that not everyone subscribes to. You know, black minority ethnic you know, it's quite unpopular in certain circles, but it's a starting point and it gives us an opportunity to have some really, you know, important conversations. What tends to happen most of the time is when you have the BME or BAME or BAME our label, our black Caribbean and African communities get lost in there because our Asian colleagues are more in terms of numbers than us. And, and sometimes there, there are issues as to how people describe themselves. So whereas you can find people who are quite bold in saying I'm Asian, I'm Muslim, and I'm LGBTQ. I don't know if it's to do with, you know, the lack of success. So not, sometimes people don't want to declare where they come from. So some of the current trends that we know, there's lack of representation from the Black Caribbean and African community in senior decision making boards right across all the sectors in, in the UK. So that tends to be, you know, the, those few people who end up in, in, in such boards or such decision making process, you know, are quite lonely and isolated. It's just about one percent. There's lack of visible role models. So thanks Auntie for coming all the way from London. But we need more of that. 
Usually when people emerge from our communities and they, they become celebrities, they get absorbed by other communities rather than we celebrating our own. There's a real issue when it comes to self-organizing and how we do stuff at strategic and grassroots level. Our community usually tends to be divided, so I'm not Ghanaian, I'm not Nigerian, I'm not this. And as a community, black community, we lack like leadership and a sense of direction really. Where do we want to be in 10 years, in 20 years? And then the whole issue around poverty and social deprivation. So why should I go to a meeting when I'm not being paid for that? When I could go and do some three, four hours cleaning job or I can go and, you know, do clock some hours at Max and Spencer or somewhere else. But once all this is happening, there are some real health issues that we're grappling with. So many black people are more likely to be diagnosed with mental health problems. You know, people experience poor outcomes, late presentations, we know that. And usually we don't engage with mainstream services. I don't want to mention about going home and, and you know, some food for talk. There are real challenges sometimes for saying, you know, I'm always thinking of going back home. And I don't know whether that impacts on how we take where we are now, where we've given birth to our children, and how we engage with a system. So how many will be school governors, how many will shape curriculum, how many will make sure that our history is taught in schools. Black people have real affiliation to faith. According to the 2011 census, 84% of us will either go to church or have an affiliation. But where is the church when it comes to decision-making process? I'm a minister as well. You know, how do we influence those we gather on Sundays, Fridays, Wednesdays to be able to go out there and influence? And then the whole stuff about our history, who is telling our story? Black History Month is a couple of you know, two months away in October, what are the plans we have to make sure that people understand our journey to this place? So there are issues around identity crisis, lack of definition, and it looks like people will tend to gravitate towards success. One bit that I included in there, as a church minister, what we find in currently, so there's a decline in the predominantly white population Christian church, but there's a rise and there's an increase when it comes to black you know, Caribbean and Africans, Africans predominantly. But what we tend to see, and it's not just the trend in Greater Manchester, is we have lots of our black people leaving the black churches and going along to white led churches. It's not a bad thing, but I think it's about time, and it shows that us, you know, pastors, black pastors, we are not being innovative enough. We are not reflecting on why there's a mass migration from our churches. I think, you know, looking at some of the challenges we have, it's important that we all learn what we know already. Some of the stuff we brought back from, you know, we brought from Africa to this place. We have to unlearn it so that we can learn the system. I mean, Bible says you can't put new wine in old wine skin. So the unlearning has to be done. There are some stuff that are relevant and some stuff that are irrelevant to the system we operate in. And it's about how we spot that and how we challenge some of those myths. So when it comes to education, our auntie was telling us, although she was a qualified midwife, she wanted to do law, she was told, you can't do a single mother, four children. How do we challenge some of those myths? How do we learn from such role models? It's really important. Employment, how many of us are aspiring, you know, right from education to employment for our children to go to Cambridge and Oxford and make sure they, you know, end up in parliament. And I think there's a real issue about some of the conversations we get involved in. There has to be a whole lot around how we reframe the conversations. So I think although we have challenges, there are real opportunities for us to really influence. And for the sake of time, you can read about the seven spheres of influence. There's a big thing that we have to think about on a daily basis, which is all about legacy. What are we living? And what we leave him behind, is it just for our family members or for the community as a whole? When you're gone, do you want to be remembered for the impact you made in Greater Manchester or London or the UK as a whole? It's time we begin to think about that and how we develop a new narrative. So although 
you know, our children will have challenges in school, they will be told they are aggressive, they are more likely to be excluded. How do we rephrase, you know, that conversation? And the faith you and I profess to have, majority of black people, how do we make sure that it's really tangible? And it's not just when we go club and fall under the power of the Holy Spirit. I think there's a real need for social movement. So you can read a bit about that. There's an organization called Nesta. They have, you know, some articles on there. But I think the first social movement as a minister, I see it started in the Bible, Genesis 11, when people came together and they said they want to build the Tower of Babel. And because they were one, they were able to do it and nothing could stop them. So I think what we need in our community to overcome some of the challenges we have is real social movement from grassroots up. So quickly, in wrapping up, what we decided to do in Greater Manchester, based on what the evidence is telling us about, you know, black people and the health inequalities, but also we have devolution. We have a devolved health and social care budget, six billion. You know, so how do we as a community make sure that we get a fair slice of the cake? So we've set up in 2017, set up this Caribbean and African Health Network as a charity, hoping to have strategic conversations. So whether it's Andy Burnham, whether it's the Health and Social Care Partnership, whether it's the Manchester Foundation Trust, we want to make sure that we're having those conversations. Currently, as our auntie says, sickle cell affects our community, but it's not commissioned from Greater Manchester. It's not on the list of the 200 priorities. How do we change that? And those are the conversations we have with commissioning. Why must we have a large po black population outside London, but then of the 200 medical conditions or health conditions, sickle cell is not a part of it. So those are the conversations we have. And when we go to commissioners, we say that for far too long, we've not been around the decision-making table. We've allowed decisions to be taken for us and things to be done for us, but now we want to be part of that whole design process. So really the vision of the organization is to transform how our community access lots of information out there. Dementia, as I had to mention, it is really difficult to come across any literature that reflects black people you know, on those literature. So for the first time, we're developing with Manchester Foundation Trust a leaflet with black people saying dementia also affects black people. So it's about how we influence the healthcare system and make sure that there's equitable distribution of resources to improve our community as a whole. So I'll stop over here because we're running out of time. But we have some flies, we have other events coming up. On the 26th of September, we're launching Black History Month from Greater Manchester. It will happen at the cathedral. It will be great to see all of us there. And yeah, you know, let's just get involved in some of the tips that, you know, our auntie shared with us from London. There are some happening here in Greater Manchester. How do we get onto the boards? I'm quite recently lots of noise in the media about the new race, sex, you know, relationship stuff. You know, if, if we are around the table and on those boards, then we can really influence and shape stuff. Thank you.